Someday soon, my Savior will call out my name. Hello, everyone. Glad you're here tonight. Hope you're ready for a Bible class. Get your King James Bible. And if you don't have one, get your pen and paper and write down all the scriptures so that you can look them up and read them. You should never trust somebody else reading scripture to you. You should trust only what you read. And um, I highly recommend, and I recommended it just this morning to a man, read Romans chapter 5, verse 1 through 11, which is what we used in last week's program. Read that over and over and over again until you know what it says. The reason is that because it's in a nutshell everything that Christ did for you and it also shows what you have because of it. So it's a great great thing to read until you just get a grip on it. Even if, you've all, if you already know you're saved, if you know you've trusted Christ as your Savior, still get a grip on those 11 verses. They will never, ever leave you short, either in conversation or in your mind. You'll always know what Christ did for you at the ready if you'll study those verses. Okay. That being said, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Just a little bit like last week's, but not very far into this message will we be like last week's. But 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And we will start reading in verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. The word constraineth you know what restrain is, or you know what strain is. If you've ever worked in a kitchen, you know what straining is. Constraineth is to push through, press through, or pull through. In other words, it's, it's straining with assistance. The love of Christ is our assistance in causing us to move. See, he says, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live, that would be us, we're alive. That they which live should not henceforth, from this moment forward, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them. That's Jesus Christ. The love of Christ constraineth us. Unto him which died for them and rose again. Now watch this next verse. He says, and this is why, if you don't have a King James Bible in front of you, be sure you write this down. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We start in verse 14. We're getting ready to read verse 16. So you look this up if you don't have your Bible in front of you. Verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth, great two words we don't use in conversation much anymore. Wherefore and henceforth. Wherefore means what, on the basis of what we've just discovered. And what we discovered was that the love of Christ constraineth us. And we judge that if Christ died for us that we should live for Him. Verse 16, wherefore, henceforth. The word henceforth means from this moment on. Verse 16, wherefore, henceforth, know we, no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh. In other words, we know about his 33-year life here. We can read about it. Paul was probably somewhere around that when it was going on since he studied in Jerusalem, but I don't know about that. I do know that I've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the other things which was said about Christ that shows that life. I know what that 33-year life was like, or 32 and a half. Notice, if you will, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, now watch carefully, yet now, henceforth, same word, from this moment on, yet now, henceforth, know we Him no more. You say, well, we know Christ. No, we don't know Christ in that earthly life. We know Christ as the Lord from heaven. We know Christ as the light above the brightness of the noonday sun which showed up with a voice that when Paul, as Saul the blasphemer said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. That was the Lord from heaven. That's the one we know. Philippians 3.20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the, uh, the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Where, where's he at? He's, he's in heaven. Well, we're on the earth. That's exactly right. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh, even Christ 
after the flesh. If you read after the flesh, Christ after the flesh, you can really read some wonderful, great, great godly words because he was a great, great manifestation of God in the flesh. But he said them to a specific people who had a specific inheritance that was not at all like your inheritance. You're leaving this earth and going to a place where Christ is now. The people that he spoke to in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not going where you're going. They're going to the place that Christ has prepared for them. He said to them, not to you, he said to them, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. <clears throat> We're not in that number. That was the twelve apostles. That was the people who followed them. Paul didn't preach to them. Paul had no business preaching to them because he blasphemed that message. He blasphemed the personage of Jesus Christ in the flesh. May I suggest to you that though you might not be able to recognize that of yourself at the moment, unless you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and trusted Him as your Savior the very first time that you heard it preached, you blasphemed also because you walked away from it. You turned your back on it. Some of you, like me, did it for a long time, for a lot of years. Now, I was fairly young when I got saved, but I knew Christ died for my sins when I was 11. And I didn't get saved until 11 years later when I was 22. So I don't know what the situation is with you, but between the time that you knew who Jesus Christ was and knew that He had died for you, somebody preached it to you. Between then and the time that you actually trusted Christ, if you have trusted Christ as your Savior, you blasphemed. And you were blaspheming simply by being a standing up against Jesus. You were blaspheming the Holy Spirit which the God has left here to be your teacher, your guide, and your seal. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Saul did that. Five times in your Bible, Saul did that. He blasphemed the Holy Spirit. But Jesus appeared unto him and gave him a message to bring to people like you and I who also blaspheme. So, well, we weren't under that curse. You can say that now if you've trusted Christ. What are you going to say if you never trust Christ? You want to know, is there an unpardonable sin? No, sins are all pardoned. Well, what is it that would make somebody go to hell then? Not trusting Christ as their Savior. Right here in this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, watch verse 19. Let's, let's read verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as, God, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. Well, notice back in verse 19. God was in Christ reconciling who? The world. Not in, unto himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. Is God holding sins against anybody from the time that he was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself? No. God does not hold sins against anybody by this message. When the message that Jesus Christ gave to the Apostle Paul came out, it included reconciliation to the world, not imputing their trespasses. Does that make the world saved? No. It makes the world not be guilty of the sins that they are in their flesh very much guilty of. So how did, they, how did the sins go away? God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. So well, why aren't they all saved then? Because he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Because he said it was unto all, but it's upon all them that believe. So God did the work through Jesus Christ. But if man will not trust in Jesus Christ, God will have no hesitation. As my friend Brian Sipes says, throwing him into the lowest parts of hell. You know, if your son went to war and he was out with a troop, with a platoon, and he saw a hand grenade fall and nobody else saw it, and he threw himself on top of it and killed himself for the sake of his platoon. If your son did that 
And that platoon never recognized it. If they never had any thought of you or the parents, then what kind of feeling would you have toward them? Now magnify that by all the sins of the world being laid upon Jesus Christ on Calvary and God using that sacrifice to take care of the price, the cost, the wages of all those sins paid. And then people turn their back on Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who gave himself for us. God is perfectly just in throwing anyone right into a smack dab, the middle of hell, if they will not trust Christ as their Savior. The message is so simple and so clear. It's what God gave us. Free salvation on the basis of His work. Do you know why man does not want to trust that? Man wants to figure out how to save himself. How well is he doing? Not good at all. Does that make any difference to him? Seemingly not. It doesn't seem like anybody thinks anything of that. Well, I'm doing my best. Well, I keep the laws best I can. Well, how do you think God feels about you breaking His laws when you're trying the best you can? He feels just like Jesus Christ did. You had sins that need to be paid for. The wages of sin is death. You want to pay for them? I was washing windows one time in a building I was going to rent for a Bible class. And the man who rented me the building, he was standing there talking to me. And I asked him if... I said, did you... He, he made some remark that gave me some inclination of what kind of religion he was. And I said, did you know Christ died for our sin? He turns and looks at me and he says, well, he didn't need to do that. And nobody had ever said that to me before. I could, my mouth kind of dropped open and... Buh. And I said, well, what would you have done about it? And he said, well, surely I could have thought of something. So I stopped what I was doing and I walked over and I said, let me tell you something. You couldn't have done anything about them. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So if you've got 50 sins and one of them causes your death, how are you going to get rid of the other 49? He stood there a moment and he said, I don't guess I thought of that. Sometime later, that man come walking into my office. That wasn't the only time I witnessed to him, but that was the most memorable. He come walking into my office, and another friend of his was sitting there in my office, and he turned and saw Don sitting there, and he said, I'm glad you're here. And he looked back at me, and he said, I want you to know I have trusted Christ as my Savior. And he turned around and walked out. Let me tell you something, folks. That's a strong testimony. That is salvation. He didn't need to tell me his whole story. I was there. I was talking to him. Almost daily, we were only the buildings were only about sixty feet apart. He trusted Christ. What's the difference? He now knew his sins were gone. He now knew there was righteousness that was put upon him. Look at verse twenty-one. For he, that's God, hath made him, that's Christ, to be sin for us. He who knew no sin, Christ knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Wow, what a chapter from verse 14 to verse 21 is the most amazing assortment since Romans 5. There's good things to be said about you with Christ. Nothing good to be said about you without Christ. Look back up in verse 16 again. He says, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Well, that means no man. You have no reason to judge men because you see them do things. Or you watch them, or even you hear words that come out of their mouth, and you go away mumbling to yourself, well, if he was really a Christian, he wouldn't have said that. Christians just might do most anything. Because we've got this flesh, and it's lousy. It's horrible. However, Christ died for every one of our sins. Before, during, and after we saved. Christ died for all of our sins. And so, we don't know man after the flesh. Paul is, in a, in a sense here, he's pleading with us not to carry on about what the flesh is doing. Man, oh man. The way the flesh hits the news screen and the entertainment screen and the gaming screen, the flesh, the flesh, the flesh, Oh, the superheroes are flying all over the world. Or pow, I killed him and he got up and started over again. And all of that is just flesh.
fleshly nonsense. So it is with figuring out what God looks like, for instance, or depicting God as some old man, which really irks me, gets to me quickly. I guess the older I got, the more it was. You know, I'm just kidding. But the point is, folks, listen. God is infinite. His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is a 33-year-old male. Today. Glorified, yes, but he's a 33-year-old male. Now look in 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Should have told you to hold on to 2 Corinthians 5. Sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Look at this. This is phenomenal. He says to Timothy, as he's finishing writing this rather long letter, since it's to one person here, six chapters. In verse 13, he says, I give thee charge in the sight of God who quickeneth all things. Now watch. And before Jesus Christ. In other words, I give thee charge in the sight of God and before Jesus Christ. As though there is... Uh, God the Father noticing this and Jesus Christ saying amen to it before Jesus Christ. Uh, who, and then he goes into who Jesus was in the flesh. Now watch how he unfolds this to get Jesus out of the flesh. He says, who before Pontius Pilate, that was in the flesh, remember, just before he was put to death, witnessed a good confession that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ who Pontius Pilate put on the cross. He says, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, for cross-reference, if you want to read it, you can go to Revelation chapter 19 and read about the King of kings and Lord of lords, and you'll see who he is. He's the Lamb of God. But nevertheless, look at the passage. He says, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 15, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now that's your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today. From standing in front of Pontius Pilate to being your Lord and Savior in the heaven with God the Father, and soon coming to get you. That's him. Go to Titus. Since we're back here close, go to Titus chapter 2. He says in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. It just appeared to you tonight in this Bible lesson. And perhaps last week, with the understanding of His love toward you, maybe it appeared there. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, I hope you've told someone. There's no reason to keep that a secret. And the reason to tell someone is that they will rejoice with you. I don't care if you're 90 years old and people thought you were saved all your life. And if you've trusted Christ, you just come forth and praise God by admitting it and giving Him the glory for it. And if you tell your sons and daughters who are 50, 60, 70 years old that you've trusted Christ as your Savior, they're going to be thrilled to know it. Even if it makes them angry that you pretended to be all along, they'll still be thrilled that you know you're saved. Whenever, wherever, however, when you trust Christ as your Savior, tell somebody. It's important. It's not part and parcel to being saved, but it's important that people who know you and love you know you have a testimony. And by the way, since I may be talking to someone who's up there in years, if you are saved and if you've been saved for a long time, may I suggest to you that you write down your testimony. How old were you? Where were you? What brought about the circumstances that led you to know that you needed to trust Christ as your Savior? And then affirm that you've trusted Christ as your Savior. And I'll tell you why. I've preached for 40 years. I've done funerals for ever since 1978. What is that? It'll be 40 years next year, I guess. Folks, the hardest thing to do at a funeral is to try to build a testimony from the hearsay of family and friends. Now, there are people who are 
going to watch this video, some watching it right now, who lost a spouse and they gave me the written copy of their spouse's testimony for me to read at the funeral. That's wonderful. If you've never written down your testimony, do so. If you have a testimony and you don't want to write it down or you can't think of the right words at the right moment or if it seems to get difficult to you, you pull a few people aside, various ages, who know you and love you, and you tell them your testimony. Whoever preaches your funeral will be very thankful. But it's bigger than that. Your testimony is a better sermon than some dude preaching your funeral will ever preach. Because your testimony is not, I know where I'm going. I know where I am. And that's a reason to write out your testimony and give it to everyone you know, especially whoever might be left after you to be said, read, and, and uh, praised over, uh, praise the Lord over at your funeral. Folks, I know how morbid that might sound at this very moment when you, <laughs> you may be sitting there so alive you're ready to get out of the house and do something really exciting. I know that's a morbid thing, but it's not so morbid when you consider that if you have not now already experienced someone whom you love having passed away, you will. So it's not morbid. Go back to Second Corinthians chapter five. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I, I stopped midstream here in Titus chapter two, verse eleven. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Yes, it is. It's really, really something. Huh. Really something. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Go back to 2 Corinthians 5 now. And remember, we don't know mankind after the flesh. So if some preacher has disappointed you and you've sworn off church, that may be a good thing. I don't know what church you went to. But if you've sworn off doing anything of a religious nature because somebody got, made you angry, they got your goat, you don't have to put up with that stuff. Boy, you're right about that, you don't. But Jesus Christ took that goat away. Jesus Christ took all the burden away. So how about, do you have anything to say for Him? He's in heaven. You're upon the earth. The words you say should match what He said for you to say. I hope I said that right. Paul wrote us 13 books through the inspiration and revelation of Jesus Christ. Everything he wrote was about the gospel. Whether he was writing about Timothy and Silas being with him, whether he was writing about having to leave someone somewhere sick. Everything that Paul wrote is about the gospel of Christ. How well do we get out the gospel of Christ? How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, was buried and was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. All that he wrote was about getting that out. Doing the work of the ministry is always about how the gospel comes out. Always. Nothing else. Some people give so the gospel can go out. Some people assist so the gospel can go out. Some people pray so that the gospel can go out. And some people go preach the gospel. None's any better than the other. Some of the sorriest people in the world are some of the best preachers in the world. Because they can preach the gospel. They've got a testimony. And they can preach that testimony. And they can do it in such a way that it draws people to Christ. And draws them to understand their need. That's all preaching is. Preaching is a, making a proclamation. If you don't preach Christ and Him crucified, you're wasting your time. I don't care if you're just talking to little kids on the street with six words. Did you know Christ loved you? Anything that glorifies the gospel of Christ in the mind of those who hear it. That's what preaching is. So everything about the ministry, no matter, I don't care if it's singing. You know, I don't think you can make up things and expect God to bless it. 
I don't think churches ought to name ministers by category. He's the minister of music. He's the minister of the seniors. She's the minister of the children. She's the minister of the teenagers. I don't think you ought to do that. If they minister the gospel of Christ, they minister the gospel of Christ. No reason to put titles on them. God never gave anybody a title except evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And he showed us very clearly that nobody's any better than anybody else about all that anyway. Attaining to that office may be a job that takes your time. But it doesn't make you better than anybody. It makes you the same sorry, good-for-nothing, low-down sinner you were, except now you're saved by His grace. And by the way, getting saved by, your, by God's grace and having eternal life sealed in your being does not ensure that you will be a good guy. Jesus said, By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Oh, yeah. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 now, and I'll get done with this in just a moment or two. Ephesians chapter 5. He talks about the wrath of God being upon children of disobedience in verse uh, 6. So I want to pick up in verse 7 because now he's talking to people that he believes are saved. He believes these Ephesians are saved. He heard of their faith in the Lord Jesus. And so he writes this to them, believing they're saved. So look at verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. What's he mean? He means don't do the same things that the children of disobedience are doing because the wrath of God is coming upon them. If you're piling around in disobedience with a guy, but you've got a testimony of salvation, and Christ comes and takes you out of here, that guy is not going to think God is fair. Say, so, well, that won't matter. No, it won't matter. But it will matter when you stand before Jesus Christ. Because he's going to say, how did you look to other people? It's not going to cost you your salvation, folks. It's going to cost you your reward in heaven. He says, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Verse 8, for you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Well, the fruit of the Spirit may not be showing up in you if you're wandering around with some sorry, good-for-nothing, low-down sinner who's lost doing the same thing he's doing. No fruit of the Spirit there, verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. In other words, if you do the things that other people do, instead of walking as children of light, you can't prove what is acceptable unto the Lord. Verse 11, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth not I'm sorry, but, but whatsoever, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. That is like walk away from those who are dead in sins, and trespasses and sins. Chapter 2 starts off with, We used to be like that. Picks up right here again, You used to be that way. Now though, don't be a partaker with them. Why? Because who you are in Christ is not like the fleshly man. Who you are in your fleshly man is just like the fleshly man, so there's no difference between you and everybody else. But in Christ, you don't know men after the flesh. You either know them in Christ, or you don't know them. That's a fact. If you know someone in Christ, you have a testimony of the same Savior. You have a fellowship which the book of Ephesians is written about. But, if you're looking at their flesh, you won't like what you see. But Christ doesn't honor your flesh. Christ honors your testimony of Him in you. I hope the Bible class has been a blessing to you. I hope you got the Scriptures written down. Reread them over and over. Be sure you understand what God is saying to you. The Bible's all written for you. But Romans through Philemon is written to you. Good night, everybody. Someday soon.